Pierce Conservation District is who I work for and I am Renee Skaggs. I'm the Farm Planning and Ag Assistance Program Director here. And I'm also the Nisqually and Clover Chambers Watershed Farm Planner. So I may visit your farm at some point in the future if you live in that area, but we also have farm planners that, that cover other parts of the, the county. And if you're not from Pierce County, there's pretty much a conservation district in every county in the US. So definitely you can reach out to your local conservation district for assistance. So what we're gonna be talking about tonight are band-aids that you can kind of limp through the winter with, and then also things that you really should be planning and considering implementing this summer when the conditions are better for that. <clears throat> so conservation districts are non-regulatory subdivisions of state government, kind of like a school district. We get a little basic funding for the state and in Pierce Conservation District, we have a rate. So if you live in Pierce County, you are already paying us up to $10 per parcel for our assistance. So happy to give you that assistance because you're already prepaid. So we can also, other than doing workshops, do farm visits, farm plans, which, which is a really detailed uh, planning process for you to reach your goals on your property. We do workshops like this, farm tours out in the field. We have financial assistance um, when available and different programs for that. We have a first five free soil testing program for pastures, commercial crops and hay fields. And then we also have some equipment rental and loan uh, pieces of equipment. So check that out on our website. Okay, so what are the issues in winter? Definitely mud, um, lots of extra water and manure that, you know, kind of the, the water and the manure and the wet soil all turn into mud and this leads to pasture damage. So basically what causes mud? Well, we get about 40 inches of rain from November to April. That's definitely our rainy period. So if your pastures have been overgrazed in the spring, summer, and winter, then you're gonna have bare soil and that's gonna to lead to mud. The manure as an organic material will actually make your mud deeper. And then of course, you've got the livestock feet, which you know are basically like plungers that are pushing through that, that wet soil and causing mud. Okay, so why is that a bad thing? Well, it causes water pollution because you've got the nutrients and sediments running off the, off the ground, you know, into a wetland or a stream or a roadside ditch. It's bad for animal health because the mud harbors a lot of bacteria. And of course it makes us and our livestock miserable. You know, it's no fun to do your chores in the winter and, you know, no fun for your animals to stand around in the mud or lay around in it. So what can you do about it now? So this is the difficult part of the workshop where I say, do not go out there with any kind of heavy equipment because you're gonna cause a worse problem than you already have now. So really this is like serious Band-Aid type thing. You don't wanna to try to get out there and put gravel out because it's just gonna end up squishing into the mud so really the only thing you can do now is put out about a foot to a foot and a half feet deep of hog fuel over the existing surface. And hog fuel, if you don't know what that is, it's ground up stumps. Usually the pieces are about six inches long and it forms a mat that the animals are up above the mud. So it's gonna squish into the mud a little bit, but that's why you wanna put it a good foot or foot and a half deep because it'll compress down and still they'll be up above that surface. So if you're doing it that, that way now, you're likely going to need to replace it this summer. So that means scraping it out, starting over either with a hog fuel application this summer or a more permanent type of footing material, which we're going to go into later in this presentation. And obviously do not place any kind of footing material or keep your animals 
in wetland buffers or other critical areas. <clears throat> and like I said, we're non-regulatory, but we're gonna tell you what the rules are in case you don't know that because we wanna keep you out of trouble with the regulators. So another thing that can help in, you know, it's not gonna solve your problem now, but it's gonna keep it from getting worse is don't waste hay. You know, don't feed your animals in the, in the dirt on the ground because they're not gonna be able to eat a lot of that food and they're gonna trample more organic matter into that mud and make deeper mud. So feeders and hay nets are really, really recommended. If you're using any kind of bedding, um, use pelleted or straw bedding because it actually composts really well and it is actually absorbent. So that's a, a great way to reduce the amount of waste coming out of your stalls. And, and definitely don't strip your stalls. There's different types of uh, footing material or bedding you could use. I can definitely send you some follow-up information of of alternative beddings like the pellets or straw where you don't need to strip the stalls. Just pick out the wet spots and pick out the, the manure. And then for sheep, um, a deep litter bedding method works well too. And this works well with chickens. You just put in a whole bunch of um, straw or wood chips and you make a deep pack in their bedding area and you just keep adding to that throughout the winter if needed. And it starts to actually kind of compost in place. And then you, you scrape all of that out in the springtime, compost it, and then it can be a great amendment to your pastures or your gardens. So that's a, a, a great way to, to bed your animals and to, to prevent waste. Okay, so those are the band-aids for now. So what do you do this summer? So construct what we call a sacrifice area. And the reason we call it that is you're sacrificing it from using it for pasture, but it's gonna now become your animal's home or where they, they hang out mostly in the winter. So uh, putting in permanent footing material, like you see here with the gravel runs and the gravel gateway will, will will basically replace that mud with a, a material that you and your livestock aren't gonna sink into. Or if you have a really well-drained soil or a large sacrifice or winter pasture, you can plant turf grass that's gonna be able to handle that high traffic and short grazing. Okay, so construction. Um, the tips to keep in mind, and like I said, we have lots of resources that we can get to you on um, how exactly to do this and all the pros and cons. And this present presentation slides and the video are going to be up on our website within about a week. So you can refer back to this too. But basically what you're want to, wanting to do is scrape this summer, not now, obviously, wait until everything's firm scrape the what was the mucky layer out you want to grade it to about a one to three percent slope so the water is going to hit the surface and drain off so that means definitely avoid steep slopes and like i said you don't want to house your animals in a critical area or their buffer and have these areas at least 100 feet from your water wells so you don't contaminate that and surface water <clears throat> So other tips are, if you do replace the mud with, with a more permanent footing material like gravel or sand, you really want to pick the manure out of there every single day. And if you don't, you can see in this photo where the horses have ground the manure into the gravel um, in the background. So that's what happens is you end up with an almost impervious layer of fine manure on top of your expensive gravel. So you have kind of defeated your purpose there. It's gonna hold water and, and just turn back into a, a mucky condition. So um, not so important with, um, with hog fuel wood chips, but definitely important for that daily removal with gravel and sand. So, and, and keep in mind that you're gonna need permits if you're bringing in material, at least in Pierce County, the, the regulations call for 
anytime you bring in more than 50 cubic yards. So we can definitely um, point you in the right direction for that process. And we do have a video on our website um, with Mike Poteet from Pierce County. He's the ag planner over there. He did a workshop with us last year on all the permits and how to go through the process for livestock keeping. And we've got a, a video of that on our website. So check that out. Okay, so depending on your type of livestock and your management style will we'll kind of determine what type of footing material you should go with. And we're gonna get into that with the different types in a few slides here. Uh, install what I call kickboards. This is uh, especially important for, for horses and for cattle. And what a kickboard is, is uh, across the stall door here, if you've got animals that, that drag bedding out of their stall, you know, by not picking up their feet, just put a two by four or a two by six across the door at the bottom of the threshold and nail it in place. And then they have to pick up their feet as they're coming in and out. We had a, a horse named Miss Piggy many years ago, and she was a foot dragger. So we had to do that in her stall. And then uh, keep in mind that long, narrow runs or a track paddock will encourage exercise if you have uh, horses. Okay, so we're gonna talk about size here. Sorry, this is uh, not coming, oh, here we go. So small enclosures would be like a 10 by 20, that's kind of a, a minimum, or 12 by 20, 16 by 16. Or if you're doing an exercise area, and you, you know, they're not getting daily exercise and you want a bigger area for them, that's more like a 20 by 20, a 20 by 100, or a 40 by 20. Okay, so, or you can do track paddocks. If you're not familiar with those, what that is, is this is your, the black area is your pasture and the light green is the, the sacrifice area where it's gonna likely end up with not having grass in it. So you want them at least eight to 12 feet wide, just for the safety of your animals so they don't get congested and, and start fighting with each other. Uh, long narrow runs here. They work well on a situation where you have like two plus acres of pasture. And then what you do is you put your water and your slow feeder in different parts of that track paddock. So what it does is it keeps your animals moving throughout the day. So you don't necessarily have to put footing material in the whole thing, but you would definitely want it, you know, in your in your real congested areas like around the water and, and the slow feeders here. Okay, trying to get this to forward. Oh, I went too fast. Sorry about that. Okay, so your size really depends on your type of animal, um, usually kind of the minimum square footage per species is a cow needs at least about 100 square feet minimum per animal. A horse is more like four to 500. Sheep and goats is 30 to 50 and um, about llama alpaca size is 30 to 50 square feet per animal. And this is, we're talking about the confined area, it doesn't, doesn't include the pasture. Obviously it's up to you and what your pocketbook, pocketbook can afford as far as putting down footing material. Okay, so biggest objectives, you know, keep it manageable, keep it clean. And uh, those are the two most important things. Okay, so alternatives to putting in footing material. If you have a, a real well-drained soil and it doesn't get very muddy, you could do just kind of annual scraping of the area, or you could plant a green band-aid like I was talking about before. These are 
sod forming grasses that can handle short grazing. So those would include bent grass, bluegrass, or you can every year you could put out annual ryegrass. Uh, this is a property in Spanaway. It's really well drained. So they just had the gravel around the feeding area and then they had bent grass here in the front so their horses could still do some nibbling. Okay, so the three main types of footing material. So this is your, your stuff that's going to be replacing mud are sand, gravel, and hog fuel. So they all have pros and cons. I'm gonna tell you right now, there is no footing material that's perfect. So you kind of have to figure out what you can live with. And definitely keep in mind that we do have farm tours at properties with different type of footing materials that you can check out. And we have a willing list of landowners that will let you come out and visit their property and be happy to talk to you about, about their experiences with these types of footing material before you go to the time and trouble and expense of putting these things in. So, you know, this is probably the least expensive route is to do hog fuel. Um, you can call, you know, all the companies in the phone book that have a chipping service. We do have a list of, of uh, places that have hog fuel available. It ties up nitrogen because the, the microorganisms in the compost are breaking down. Um, they're actually breaking down the wood material using the nitrogen. So it's kind of a, a pro and con there. And definitely option of less labor. This is a material that this is what you want to have if you have cattle because you can't pick up their manure. So basically what's going to happen is they're just going to keep pooping on this all winter and then you scrape it out after a year or two once it starts to break down. And like I said before, you really need to, once it starts rotting, you really need to scrape this out of there because if you don't, and if you just keep letting it go or you put new material on top of there, what's going to happen is you're going to have the deepest mud you've ever seen and your animals are going to squish through the, the top crust into some really black mud. So definitely don't keep adding to it, you need to replace it after a while, at least one to two, maybe three years if you're lucky. So um, it varies widely in quality. You know, before you call the company and have them deliver it to your property, I would, I would literally go to the yard and see what it looks like because you really want, like I said, those big six inch pieces to form a mat. If it's a bunch of little material or you know, if, there's, if they're grinding up construction debris and trying to sell it as hog fuel, it's going to have nails and all, all sorts of garbage in there. And obviously you don't want that with your livestock. You've got to put it in on that one to three percent sloped ground. If you've got humps and bumps on the ground surface, the water's going to sit there and it's going to rot your hog fuel faster. And like I said, it's, it's harboring microorganisms so the bacteria in there you're going to really have to have really good um, feet cleaning um, because you know your horses or other animals can can start getting thrush and when I used hog fuel at a rental property we lived in we first moved out here um, definitely had to treat my horses hawks for um, for, for rain rot in the winter. Okay, so the way to install it, so, so it lasts that two to three years would be um, putting it over quarry spalls, which are seen here on the left. And those are the big, you know, three, four, five inch crushed rock. You lay that down in a single layer and you pack it down with a plate compactor or roller, and then you or you put it over um, straw that you, you know you get a round bale and roll it out, or you get um, try to find on eBay or I mean a Craigslist a load of local hay that had been a little too wet when it was baled up and it makes that nice firm almost like tile. So you lay this out first, and like I said, you put 
a good foot, foot and a half deep of hog fuel on top of that. And, and why it's so important to have this quarry spalls or straw or hay underneath is it makes an interface layer that keeps the material from squishing into the mud. So, you know, if you're putting out hog fuel right now, right on the ground surface, which is basically all you could do, it's, it's going to squish into the soil, it's going to rot a lot faster. So if you want your material to last two or three years, you really need to put it over this interface layer. Okay, so gravel lasts a lot longer, it drains a lot better, nice solid footing. However, it can be too solid for animals to lay down on, so you need to have an alternate area for them to lay on. A um, little bit more difficult to pick manure. This is not a good option for sheep, goats, or cattle. It's really only good for horses, um, unless you're doing a gate area that you know is going to get a little bit mucky, you know, little layer of mud on top and the animals aren't going to hang out there as much. And definitely more expensive than hog fuel. Okay, so the way to keep it from squishing into the soil, in my 20 something years of, of being a farm planner, I've heard, I wish I had a, a dollar for every time someone said, oh, I put gravel in and it just disappeared. But what, what's happening there is they're not using an interface layer like you see here, either using the grids or um, this is paper mill belting in the center. And I've seen people actually using um, old carpet that they put upside down with the, the fluffy side down. And um, that is providing that interface layer that's keeping your livestock from squishing the gravel into the ground. So still need that one to 3% slope. Your options really are 3 8 and 5 8 clean, which means the the little tiny fines have been washed off, which makes it a looser material. Um, if you say you get 3 8 minus, minus means it's 3 8 down to sand size, and that's the binding material that, that holds the rock in place, like in your driveway. So either of those, either washed or clean, is, or washed or with fines work, but they they have a little bit different properties. If they don't have those fines, they're gonna move around a little bit. So you may need to put railroad ties around it like in this picture. So we have all sorts of installation recommendations that, that I can send you all. Um, pea gravel works really well. It moves around a lot more. It's comfortable for the animals to lay down on, but same thing, you're gonna need to install it with railroad ties around it or else it'll kind of travel out of your paddock area. And then reject rock is generally smaller rock, but there are the occasional big chunks in there. And this is a, a lot less expensive route to go if you don't mind picking the big pieces out. OK, so sand. Um, the, this one is a great option for horses, sheep, and goats. It's really easy to pick the manure out of, provides a nice soft footing. I have sand in my paddocks. One of the previous slides um, of that red barn with the run-in shelters was my, my place, and my horses love to lay on it. They're out you know, laying on the beach, basically. However, it's the most expensive option because you have to put a couple of layers under there, which we're gonna go into in the next slide. It does not drain as well as gravel. So when we get those days and days and days of rain, I do have a couple of puddles out there. You have to be super cautious if you are um, having horses on it, you know, don't feed on the ground. You've got to use, uh, I have hay nets above troughs and I keep my my stalls cleaned out because I do not want them to ingest any sand. And then on top of that, I use a psyllium product once a year. Definitely requires daily picking because, you know, just like gravel, if they grind the sand 
or uh, the manure into the sand or gravel, it's going to be really hard to get out of there. I, I do have clients that say if, if they've gone out of town and couldn't find anybody to, to pick their paddocks on top of feeding the animals, at least with gravel, you can take a pressure washer and, and blast all those fine pieces of manure off of there once you get home from vacation. But that's definitely not an alternative with sand. So making some daily chores for you, sorry. Um, the way you install it is you either put it over the quarry spalls, as you see in the left, just like with the gravel, or you use um, the grids. Putting it over the, the, the fabric is not really an option because um, generally your, your horses are gonna get down to it and, it and it also doesn't drain as well that way. So um, once again, one to 3% slope, put it in four to six inches deep. If you're using the grids, you don't need to put it that deep. You just need to put it as you know, deep enough to fill in those little voids. And you want to use coarse sand. So when you order it from the, the quarry, it's going to be called washed or builder sand. So, and the reason that is, is you don't want a whole bunch of fines in there because it'll drain even more poorly. Okay, uh, my pictures, here we go. So um, the other options are, like I was saying, you know, maybe your trouble spots are only your gates. So you could put material around your gates, either like you see in this picture or in a previous one where they had railroad ties around the, the graveled area. Combinations, this landowner has, um, they have concrete in the front and gravel in the back. I have had landowners that have gravel in the front, front where they've got the real high traffic areas. And then they have hog fuel or sand farther out in their paddocks so their, their animals can lay on that. Um, or, you know, maybe you're just putting your gravel or, or footing material around your feeding area. Maybe that's your only trouble spot. Okay, so um, water obviously is an issue in the winter. So what you can do now, you don't have to wait until the summer, is you could... Far right picture here, you could put gutters up and then just roll out your um, corrugated pipe and send the water away from your, your barn area. Just have to make sure your animals don't have access to that area in the winter so they don't trample your pipe. This was the property we rented when I first moved here. So we were renting and we didn't want to spend a lot of money on the place, obviously. So we put this corrugated pipe out in the winter and then rolled it up in the summertime. And then um, you can even collect water for your, your livestock water drinking by having a downspout diverter. So the water comes down the pipe here, you flip the switch, fills up their water trough, or you send it out into the pasture through the other connection. Um, and obviously, you know, really important for water quality is to keep your animals from surface water. And you can do that right now with temporary fencing. It doesn't have to be permanent fencing. You use temporary electric. Okay, so what to do this summer? Um, you know, if you do have a water body on your property, um, like I said, we're not regulatory and we're not gonna turn you in, but it is the law that you cannot send uh, manure or sediment into surface or, or wetlands. So we do have fencing um, financial assistance available. We can help you out with this. We do have some nose pumps like the photo in the left that we can loan out. So if you decide you like that kind of system, you could purchase your purchase your own later, or we can assist you with financial assistance for that. We do have an engineer that we share with the Snohomish Conservation District, so we can help you install drainage systems using their assistance, so you're not guessing on what to do. We can come up with designs for you. And obviously, don't send any of this 
water from your gutters or from your barn area to wetland ditches, creeks, or off your property. It can naturally flow off your property if that's what it's already doing, but you can't intentionally run a pipe off of your property into the, the county road ditch or other. Okay, so kind of the rundown on different drainage systems. Um, permanent underground outlets for your for your uh, gutters on your barn or other buildings next to your animals look like this. Basically, you dig a ditch two feet under the ground, and as long as the outlet pipe here and here are lower than the bottom of your gutter, which is up here, then the water is going to keep flowing this direction. So um, definitely our engineer could help you with that. He's got survey equipment. Uh, you want to daylight this pipe into a grassy area, put some gravel around it, and definitely protect that pipe if it is in your pasture. So you could place large rocks over this so you don't run over it with your tractor so your animals don't don't damage it. And permits may be necessary even for underground outlets if you're disturbing a certain amount of square footage of, of uh, property by installing your pipe. So we can definitely assist you in calculating that. Okay, so French drains, if you don't know what that is, it's this pipe here that's set in the ground with filter fabric and uh, drainage rock. And the, the rock goes all the way to the surface. And what it does is water coming across the slope hits, hits the gravel, goes into the pipe here, and then you direct the water that you're rerouting to an, another area. So if, if you've purchased a property where the barn was built in the hole and water is running that way, this is a a great way to, to reroute that water. So you can either do it this way or you could build a basically what we call a speed bump up here. So the water would hit that, hit the speed bump and be redirected around. So um, I've, I've heard of people, you know, people always ask me about putting these in front of their stall doors to collect water from their paddocks. So if this is your paddock up here above, I would not recommend that because this needs to be kept super clean and you don't want a whole bunch of sediment or manure going in there. So if it's in your paddock area, it's, it's always gonna get clogged. So if you've got this situation where your barn is built in the hole and, and this is the, the stall door and you've got water running the, this direction, don't put a French drain in, but put a speed bump in. And like I said, our engineer can help you design that. Okay, so other things, uh, we talked about berms, which are basically those speed bumps. Catch basins, where if you have water coming, not just across a slope, but from a, a very specific point source, you could send it into a catch basin, collect it and reroute it. Or you can do, this is a, a schematic of a dry well. So what this does is basically you've dug a big hole in the ground. It only works really well in well-drained soils. So you're sending water in here and then it's gonna disperse underground in the groundwater. And keep in mind, this, this definitely has to be out of your paddock area because if it's in a paddock area, you're sending manure right down to the groundwater. So you definitely don't want to do that. And once again, um, these, these may require permits. We can help you through that process. Okay, so benefits of good manure management. Um, if you're managing your manure, you're going to reduce mud because you're going to have less organic matter building up, creating mud. If you're managing your compost stockpile, it's going to actually reduce the pile size through the composting process. So you don't end up with mountain manure over here. If it's ex actively composting, it's gonna reduce odors and uh, flies. It's gonna save you money because 
you're going to have less money going out purchasing fertilizer. And if you are taking your manure off site, it's going to be less in tipping fees for you. And if you're building a structure, you're not going to have to build as big of a structure. And obviously, water quality is a concern of the conservation district. So it's very important to us that it's going to prevent water pollution. Okay, so what can you do about it now? It's, you know, kind of difficult to build any kind of structures right now because you'd have to bring that heavy equipment in and you're going to make a big mess. So the very easiest thing you could do right now, which actually makes a huge difference, is to go out and buy the blue tarp or the gray one, silver one, if you don't like blue, and cover your manure pile. And what this is going to, it's going to really help it compost. It's going to keep those nutrients within the manure and keep it from leaching out. It, it will really make a big difference. So if you don't remember anything else from tonight, remember that piling and tarping your manure is, is super, super important. So you could get a container hauling service. There's a couple in the county and we have a list that we can send you of, of facilities do, that do that. They can bring a container to you and you can dump in there and you give them a call and they take it to a compost facility once it's full. Or you could build bins with pallets or straw bales or, or other easy materials like this, railroad ties. Um, so location, you to avoid the runoff, you definitely wanna keep it high and dry. You wanna keep it covered, like I said, at least 50 feet away from water bodies. So in this photo, the manure pile is right here and it's draining, running across the ground right into this seasonal swale that's going into a creek. So you definitely don't want to do that. You don't want to have it here um, right next to a, a, a wet area where all this uncovered manure is leaching into that. So, you know, planning for this summer. So if you want to build permanent bins, we have designs that we can share with you and, and kind of the, the, the materials include poured concrete bins or you could do treated woods. These are the manure bins at my place. You could do concrete blocks. Um, this really works well if you have a larger facility because each of these blocks is really wide and they take up a lot of room. And then once you have composted that manure or even the pile that you're covering right now, um, you can apply the, that manure onto your pastures. And then if you're building these permanent bins, um, usually you don't have to go through the full permitting process, but a couple of reviews are needed and we can help you with that. Okay, so kind of the requirements to get it to actually compost and not just sit there and, and smell is um, you need the right amount of oxygen. So that means either installing um, pipes like this, these are, are septic drain filled pipes, or some facilities you can um, do forced air through them, either through this piping system or through um, um, hoses that have holes in them that you place your manu manure on top of it. Um, you want the correct moisture. If you grab the material in your pile, if you squeeze it, you should only really see one drop of water. It shouldn't be squeezing out. And we call that wet as a wrung out sponge. And then um, you want the correct carbon to nitrogen ratio. You want it to be about 30 to one. And usually horse manure is about 29 to 1, 29 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. And bedding is about 500 to 1. So this is why we really recommend don't use a lot of bedding because if you're putting a whole bunch of woody bedding in there and just a little bit of manure, it's very unlikely that your material is going to actually compost. So um, just basically, if it's not too wet, then you're going to have the correct oxygen amount. And then when it's actually composting, the temperature will be about 120 
to 150 degrees if you've got that material at least three feet deep. So I see a lot of properties where they kind of have the blob pile of manure out there and it's only, you know, two, one to two feet tall because they're emptying the wheelbarrow and then they, instead of piling it up, they, you know, end up closer and closer and closer to the barn. So you need to really push that material up to at least three feet to actually get it composting. And we've got some great guides on composting and, and uh, some tips on, you know, if you're not getting the temperatures, you know, the possibility it could be X or got some troubleshooting guides. Okay, so the benefits of composting, like I said previously, it actually reduces the pile size, sometimes up to about 50%. So in my manure bins, I have two bins. So I fill up the first one, October through the end of January, and then I start building the second pile. And usually by the time um, May gets here and I'm gonna put out that first bin, the pile is literally dropped down about 40%. So it usually drops about at least two feet through the composting process. So when it's composted, it actually makes a slow release fertilizer that will release nutrients over about a two year time period. So if you, you're composting and you have less manure in volume, you're not gonna have to pay as much for disposal in tipping fees, and you're gonna save a lot in fertilizer. So for my property, I, I apply all of my compost. And so then I only need to buy nitrogen and sulfur if I want to amend my pastures. I'm getting all the phosphorus and potassium that my pastures need. And so, like I said, it's reducing your parasites and your flies. And if it's going through the composting process, it, it definitely makes it a better smelling product. So if you are putting it back out on your property, we have a couple of manure spreaders like this one that we rent out and um, can deliver to your property even on a trailer. But when you're putting it out, you want to apply it at least 35 feet from a water body and out of wetland buffers or stream buffers. Apply it only when the plants are growing. So April through early October. And usually you don't wanna put it out in the dry season. So I, I'll put mine out middle of April is kind of the earliest up through about the 1st of June. And then I will apply what I collect over the summer out onto the fields in early September up to about early October. And then you want the proper amounts for your nutrient needs. So generally, if you've got a pretty decently producing pasture, you can put out two, two horses worth of manure on, on one acre. So for instance, my property, I have about seven acres of pasture and I have about seven horses. And when we put our manure out in the spring at about a one inch application rate, we only are covering about probably two acres of our pastures. So usually I will apply, you know, pastures one, two, and three in the spring, and then pastures four, five, six in the fall. Then I'll rotate around like that. Okay, so switching over to pastures, kind of the common problems that you see this time of year, if your animals are out there, other than mud, are soil compaction. And what that is, is the soil particles, even though they're tiny, there's pore spaces in between them that you can see in this, this you know, kind of blown up photo. And um, what happens if, if they pack all these soil particles together is the water and the air can't pass in between them. So you basically end up with um, a compacted layer where your water sits on top and your roots can't infiltrate in between those soil particles. So then you end up with 
tap rooted weeds that, that can do that when the grass can't break through there. So, and then um, other problems we see are poor fertility um, or nutrient overloading. So the grass isn't growing well enough and it can't take up the nutrients that might be deposited out there through your livestock. We see a lot of overgrazing. So that means they're grazing it too short for the plants to be able to sustain themselves or selective grazing where they're picking and choosing what they eat. So you either see really tall grass that they're not eating or, or grass down to the ground. And then other, other issues are weeds. So kind of what you can do about it now is have your soil tested and then you know to plan for your spring nutrient application and what you can do to get your pastures growing better. And then the best thing really is to keep your animals off your pasture, either in a sacrificed area or, or pick your highest and driest pasture. So you're, you're saving the rest of your pastures to use as grazing areas. So then kind of this summer, you know, you, and over the winter, you kind of just need to determine what are your goals for your pastures? You know, do you want to reduce your feed bills like I do? This, this is my pasture and, and basically I don't have to feed my seven horses, usually April, May, June, July, sometimes into August, I don't need to feed them supplemental hay. They're just eating grass. Um, you know, is environmental quality, is that one of your issues? Do you, you don't care about buying hay and you just want to provide a nibbling area? You know, do you want to just have an exercise area? Do you want to increase your livestock numbers? You know, are you commercial operation where you want to feed your cattle or sheep and want to grow more grass? And, you know, is reducing weeds one of your, your concerns? So we're not gonna go into super detail here, but the main things to remember for pasture management, if you want the grass to sustain itself and stay healthy is kind of put your animals out on a field when it's at least six inches tall and move them to the next pasture when it's grazed down to about three inches on average. So if you have one large pasture, it's gonna be really hard to do this. So that's why we recommend you cross fence, which means you're setting up multiple fields and you move your animals around based on the, the height of your grass stubble. So that three inches. So then if you have a lot of animals and a little bit of acreage and you are doing this rotation and you're, you're flying through their their pastures and you're not ending up, you know, by the time you get to number one and it's, it's not back up to at least six inches, that's when you put them in your sacrifice area for either X number of hours a day or during that week or two where it takes for your pastures to grow back. It's, it's going to take you a couple of years to really figure out your grazing system if you're starting with one big pasture and then then you start rotational grazing. So I can't tell you, oh, you need X number of acres per animal, but generally as a rule of thumb, you need, depending on the intensity of your grazing management, you need at least one to two acres per thousand pound animal. So then this spring you can fertilize if you need to based on your soil test results, put out lime, which really um, helps if we if you have acidic soil and you're not correcting that pH, then the plants physically can't take up the nutrients that you and your animals are depositing out there. So if if you don't do anything else nutrient management wise, I would always recommend that the first thing you do, if nothing else, is to lime your fields to to correct the pH, because that that will once you get it neutral, it'll last you 10 to 15 years before you have to lime again. And then it will allow those plants to use the, the nutrients that are being applied in manure. And then control your weeds, the ones that are really detrimental to your livestock and, and take up a lot of space from your grasses. 
So if you are gonna do any seeding, we really recommend doing it in the fall. It's usually when you're gonna have the best success. Usually about Labor Day weekend is like the perfect weekend to do that before we start to get some rain. This is our no-till drill that you can use. Um, you basically just have to pay for the hauling fees or you could do it through um, mowing or grazing your pastures super short and overseeding um, after you drag it. We've, we've got some really great pasture renovation guides I can send you. Um, spot seed, just kind of in those areas that might be a little bit thinner in front of your gates or where your animals hang out. Um, fall is, like I said, a great time to put out your compost. It's a great time to lime, especially if you're gonna use the flowered lime that takes several months to wash in. Probably gonna have to pull your livestock off if you're not using agricultural lime. Um, and then if your pastures are too wet and you don't want them to end up being compacted, then you need to pull your animals off, usually around October, November before they start causing damage again. Okay, so I'm sorry, but we're right at 7.30. But like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we have farm planners that are available to come walk and talk on your property. We've got lots of information in detail that we can send you about the topics tonight. Um, you know, sources for hog fuel, our engineer. Anybody have questions? Looks like oh. you did such a good job. Oh, there's one. Oh, can you give us the website or address getting info on equipment loans, hog fuel, et cetera? Okay, so um, Mark, our list of equipment that we have available to loan and rent out is our website. And it's, I'll put it in the chat, piercy.org. Pretty easy one. Um, there is a, on our farm program, you go under that and it says equipment. You click on that and you scroll down and it shows you all the different one. So, um, a list of folks that supply hog fuel and resources on how to do that. Um, I will be happy to email that to you. I'm not sure if it's on our website. So Levi, you could tell me Mark's contact information, right? From the sign in. Um, yeah, should be able to. Okay, Mark. So I'll be happy to email you that information. Okay, so the next question is, can you plant grass seed over hog fuel? Well, just like compost, um, hog fuel has a lot of fluffy voids in between it. So if you try to plant grass on that, it's not gonna live because it, it, it's gonna dry out in the summertime. You know, it might sprout and I see grass starting on old manure piles and hog fuel. But usually what ends up living on hog fuel or, or compost piles, manure piles are weeds because those tap roots can get through the compost and the hog fuel down to the soil and, and survive, but usually grass cannot. Any other questions? Well, if nobody does, have a wonderful evening and thanks for coming and, and uh, the presentation the video and the slides are gonna be up probably within about a week on our workshop section, the, the farm workshop section on our, on our website if you need to check back and reference anything. And definitely feel free to follow up with email questions if you want, if you think of something later. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Levi.